of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <laughs> Good morning. Hi, good morning, mate. How are you going? Oh, it's fine. I know it's so late for you. <laughs> I, okay. uh, you know what today? You know what today is? Tell me. Well, today is by order of Abraham Lincoln, my favorite president, Thanksgiving Day. And it has very little to do with pilgrims, although that's what they teach in school. Uh, pilgrims that came over here from, uh, I think it was, uh, it wasn't England, actually. It was, uh, oh my, I'm, it's really early. The pilgrims came here to this in around 1620 uh, from, I want to think, uh, Geneva, Switzerland or someplace. You know, that's where they really, uh, some other country that. <clears throat> anyway, the, the, it's really not so much about that because they were basically trying to keep the festivals and and they were with the natives and the festivals were that they were keeping were, were like a week long, you know. And uh, but today was by order of Abraham Lincoln, the day that we're to to give thanks to the Creator because of the end of the Civil War between the North and the South. Nice. That's really about that's what it what it was established for but uh you know people are uh, you've probably seen the pilgrim costumes and the plays and all that and they keep talking about turkeys and so forth it really it's really about the end of the civil war oh. you know but it's uh it's fun a little revi revi revision of history a little redacting wonderful <laughs> yeah well that's what today is here you all don't have a Thanksgiving, you said, right? No, we don't do Thanksgiving over yeah. here. No. Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of uh, Nazarim, are, uh, they have their hackles up because they think that we're disobeying if we even observe this day, you know, as a family. Uh, all the businesses pretty much close, except for the ones. I've, I heard some advertisements where they're going to be open, uh, you know, all day, all night, you know, trying to get a, a little business. But uh, the few businesses that are open are going to do well, probably. But it, it, basically, it's been a national family day, you know. So um, the citizens of the United States are not thinking it's so much, um, you know, anything but you know, family day, you know. I and mean, we get together and we pray. We thank Yahuwah for, you know, all that he's given us. And we can thank him every day. There's no harm to so uh, those of, of the audience that are not celebrating uh, Thanksgiving, we still love you, and uh, we think that we hope the best for you. It's just that some of us do, and we're not disobeying, you know. Yeah. But, uh, we're not doing anything pagan, you know. <laughs> well, that's nice. You get a day off today. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. It'd be like taking off uh, for any reason, like uh, National Plumber's Day. You know, all these people that go out and fix the pipes. Mm -hmm. uh, but th we don't have that. I'm, I'm making that up. But, yeah. <laughs> so how was your week? Yeah, uh, really good. Busy week. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah, full on, always full on. Never know what's going to happen each week. Yes, I know. Yeah. And, and I really enjoyed, uh, I was really taken with the um, job that you did with that video, that last video. I was shocked. I, uh, I literally got to work one morning a bit earlier than usual. And saw your email there, and it was yeah. about about fifteen minutes till my staff were going to arrive. And I thought, just feel like doing something, so I just pushed record. And uh, yeah. th this computer will chuck a little funky background behind you if you want it to. It's not perfect, yeah. but it works. 
And I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking, oh, it's probably not that good. I'll chuck it up. I like to put things up sort of regularly. And sure. uh, everybody's just going ape over it. I'm just like, wow, that's definitely Yahusha because you, oh, you work for ages and ages and try and get these things technically perfect. And sometimes there's a, you know, the message may not be that good or, you know, but you're going for a visual thing. And uh. then I realized just from a lot of the comments that people are just wanting food. People are just wanting the the pure word from Yahua. And so, and the other thing was when you sent it through, it was nice and short. So I thought, oh, that won't take, that'll take me a couple of minutes to say it. And, uh, but I was just amazed. And uh, Chris said to me, well, that's great. You, you're practicing the the language of the Torah because he's been talking the last few weeks about how, uh, like with our children, we want them to talk and speak to us. And uh, he said, learning Torah is like learning another language. Uh, you got to practice it. Uh, practice it in your day-to-day -day life. It's not about all this scholastic knowledge all the time. It's about just practicing the Torah. And if you don't practice it and it's just in your head, then, uh, you know, it's useless. So he said you got to start off like a child and just start practicing it and you just get better and better and better at it. And uh, it's not always about learning the Hebrew all the time because other people have done that for us. It's just about speaking and knowing the, the scripture and, you know, Hebrew is important, but, you know, it's a lot of people are learning the Hebrew, but they're not practicing the actual Torah itself. They're not loving. Um, yeah. So um, what was I talking about? <laughs> I forget. Oh, um, you're going to talk about Torah. That yeah. Torah talk that's coming out of you. That's <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I was amazed. So I'm glad everybody liked it. Uh, yeah, I was really blown away when you mentioned in there, well, many things that you said. I just typed it up as, as soon as I could because he woke me up in the middle of the night and you said he probably woke him <laughs> up. And I'm going, what? How did he know? And <laughs> anyway, that's what happened. I took notes and yeah. uh, keep a little pen and pad by my, you know, at a light. And uh, sometimes I get a flashlight out, to, you know, but some, usually it's just a little lamp. And then I turn it and I write down. And I'm so sleepy when I'm writing it down. Sometimes it's been, there's been cases where I was writing in the dark and I would be writing scribbles over words on top mm. of other words. And it was, <laughs> and it's really hard to read that, but I can get it. But hard anyway, to fix. <clears throat> yeah, mm. but uh, yeah, mm. I was writing it down. And, uh, and, and so I jumped on the computer composed it right there on the uh, email and uh, and there it was and uh, and you read it and then a little later I said well wait a minute a lot of the people won't know what the symbols are the the actual components themselves like lepers they don't necessarily know that the lepers are all of us sinful people that are dying from the from the first man and woman you know that mm -hmm. when we did the study on leprosy remember um, I forget the title of that. Uh, what was it? Uh, we we discussed it in a seminar that lep leprosy, the leprosy of sin, that causes this body to change and die. And I think it was the lamb. Plants. Was it the lamb legacy? The lamb. Legacy? That might have been it. Because you were because you were talking about doves and goats and things like that. Yeah, that's right. The lamb legacy, and then the the topic within that about the problem that we have and why we need the blood of the lamb for life because our because we're body our bodies are uh, bodies of sin and death that's what we are the bodies are but we have in our spirit the life you know and uh, you were saying that in uh, very clearly in that video mm. you brought that out I hope everybody goes to see his video on that. Mm. It, it, that, that. What was it called? The Modern Parable? Modern or parable. A Modern Parable? Yeah, the, was it The Touch of the Physician? The Touch of the Physician, yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I immediately knew what to call it. Mm. You know, it was, it, it's when he comes and personally does something to you, it can happen in the day or the night, mm. driving in your car, mm. you know. He just overcomes you, you know. Yeah. When you actually turn away from yourself and you and you think about others more than yourself and you, you it, it's what uh, 
you know, we're, we're reading about it in the brief Kadasha, that our bodies are living sacrifices, you know. We're not living for ourselves. We're offering ourselves so that our service and our body, while we're in our body, we're actually serving others. And then I, <laughs> that was that big fish again. Trying to, he's trying to catch Yonah. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I was reading uh, Revelation chapter 22, and it said the bride and the spirit and the bride say come to all who will hear and are thirsty. And I'm thinking, well, that's during the thousand-year millennium. You know, the, and when the bride is, you know, the bride better be there at the supper. You know, a lot of people think the bride's going to be there at the end where the great white throne judgment's happening. Of course she won't be, but uh, when this, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding supper happens, it's going to happen to the first resurrection at his coming because the bride is going to be this group of the dead first and then the living who are yet alive and then we'll come down, and then he will come down and then the, the spirit and the bride during that thousand years are saying come all you know and they're and they're saying hear the words you know and that's what we, you were saying you're teaching your children mm. it's uh, mm. and it isn't so much uh, technical knowledge mm. it's uh, you know getting the the love in your heart you know and, and he writes a, lo a love for his his Torah his covenant upon your heart. He does that. And then because you've given yourself to him as a as an empty vessel to fill, you know. Mm. It's one it's really and if, mm, yeah. It's really about him because yeah. often when you do things of yourself and sometimes I might feel a bit of a hankering to just produce something, anything, and you put it out there and you'll you should, probably shouldn't, but you're, you're seeking confirmation, and sometimes the, there's just silence. <laughs> there's nothing, and you think, okay, maybe that was maybe that was of myself. Maybe that was me trying to do something or stir something up. But then, and that's what Amy was saying to me. She said, "See, you don't have to worry when Yahusha tells you to do something, and you may not even think it's that good, like technically." Um, it just floods in, reactions flood in, you get, you get all this confirmation left, right and centre. So it's encouraging because I feel like I'm just still experimenting, hearing him, was that you or was that me? Or And so it's that's where I'm at, practising the speaking. Some clients I'll speak to about Yahushua and some clients I'll say something and I'll walk away and I go, oh, yeah, shouldn't have said that. And sometimes I'll, sometimes you'll be a bit abrupt and sometimes you won't be. And So I'm in that place where I'm sort of experimenting or like Chris said, you're you're practicing the Torah. You're expressing it. Uh, so it's uh, it's amazing to just go through that process where you're trying to, like you've said, overcome yourself, sort of try and get yourself out of the way and just just shut your face until he tells you to say something. Don't try and cause trouble. Uh, that's sort of what I'm doing. I'm trying to experiment a bit. Cause, uh, yes, yeah. When people will uh, first learn a little truth, quite often they're so ze they're filled with zeal, but they're uh, blasting out, and their families are the first layer that get the light, and the light is so brilliant that they're overcome by it because of the there. It's really more of uh, their own personal you know, activity that they're, that they're projecting. And it's a, it, it comes across as judgmental, you know, to the other people. Yeah. And uh, they don't get the love. They don't feel the love. Uh, married couples, uh, quite often, one will change because Yahushua's come into them and the husband or the wife has not. And they're going, whoa, you know, suddenly what's going on? You know, you, you've been in, reading that Lou White stuff or whatever. I hear that too. It isn't about Lou White. It's about whoever the message bearer is, but it, it, but it's not about that. It's not about the message bearer. It's about the, the, the Messiah coming through and reaching people like the wind blows. You don't know where it comes from, but the thing of it is they get filled with zeal and they start driving the other partner away. 
Mm. And sometimes it happens when they're older. Sometimes it happens when they're young. Sometimes a, a young teenage girl or boy will hear the truth and Yahushua will call them and come into them. And then they're trying to explain it to their siblings or, or their parents. And their parents are just really upset. And sometimes a parent will fire an email at us saying, what if you talk my child? You know, and they're not old enough to talk to you. They're 16 years old, you know, and, and I, you know, we just say, well, we're sorry. We didn't know they were that young, but it, it's a matter of, uh, you know, if, if they're kindness, if they're, if the people are being kind, then they don't uh, see the problem, but there's a lot of animosity and there shouldn't be that, you know, mm -hmm. see the knowledge thing, people are out there going, let's look at the Kabbalah. Let's look over here at the Talmud. Let's get this thing straight. And uh, this stuff is all a facade. It's a now. It's just about knowledge. It's not about love. You don't open the Talmud and immediately go, "Wow, this is all about love." You know, you don't get that. You know, the, but the scriptures, you you open them and they're alive. Those words, even in translational layers, you know, you can feel the life pouring out of them. That's why when I was studying science and the various disciplines of science. I was looking for truth. That's what science means. Skier in Latin means to know. Science. To know. You know. And so uh, I wasn't getting the truth because there was all this, you know, it was all hi uh, conjecture and hypotheticals. And they, uh, some things conflicted with other things. So I knew and I'd given up. I said, I give up. Uh, these people don't know what they're talking about. And they really don't have any foundations, what it is. So then I, uh, Phyllis facilitated a way for me to read the scriptures. And she put, I, I've mentioned this before, I opened it up to the middle of the, of the book. And I read Yeshayahu, that's Isaiah, chapter 53. And the first thing I read, and I was like 35 years old. Uh, I think you're 34, aren't you? Yeah. And when I was your age, all I knew was science, mm. and I had no scripture, and uh, now I'm 61, almost 62, mm. but uh, yeah, uh, don't worry about me being old, I mean, uh, it, what was it, uh, Caleb didn't even get really started until he was like in his mid-80s or so, wow. you know, I mean, he was doing things, of course, you know. Mm. Uh, but uh, he he really did uh, some wonderful things when he got older. Uh, but uh, you know, I've always said to to Yahusha in prayer that I have to listen to him more than I have to speak. You know, because I I'm I'm, I'm a sponge. You know, and I and I want to just be his conveyance. But you know, whatever he wants to teach me, I'll share. But the thing of it is, I've always felt like. All of, all of the time that I've been studying and I'm soaking up his words like a sponge in order to drain them out into other people, of course. But the, um, the objective is to get me to a place where I understand. And, of course, the place is to learn love. It's that simple, like you were saying. It isn't acquiring a load of knowledge. You know, you don't have to know a lot of things, but... When you can get to the point where you see the, the the objective, what? It's love. This is great. You know, it's mm. so simple. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it is. The Torah is the instruction to love Yahuwah and to love your neighbor. And that's all it is. Mm. So how does it feel to be like a, I guess you'd say a pioneer in all things pagan customs. Like uh, there's so many, everywhere I go now online, there's people putting out things about uh, the origins of pagan customs and you know, all this sort of stuff. And I'm going, I wonder how Lou feels. He found out this stuff, what, 35 years ago? And, uh, you know, I guess you'd just be rejoicing because the more people that know is the better, I guess. Yes, and when I started to look for truth after I left the science, the seeking of science, I was open. I was picking up ancient before the internet. Uh, I was picking up old encyclopedias, 
and I even acquired a couple of different encyclopedias that were older. And one was from the 1890s, and I couldn't afford it, but I wanted to buy it. But uh, it was uh, just filled with information about the past, you know. And it, and I learned about a lot of things. But history has been redacted so much and revised. And the more current the encyclopedia is, the less information it has and the less truth it has. Really? Less and less and less. Wow. Yes. Because of the fact that they're changing things and they're changing the reasons for things. And, you know, like I was mentioning the pilgrims, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the celebration of Thanksgiving, you know, that's been changed, you know. Wow. But... Uh, Anyway, the, the, the history is just really, uh, that's why they burned down uh, the, the, the library at Alexandria. You know, I'm sure those weren't accidental fires. Of course, there were probably a lot of candles and lamps, people trying to find things out after dark, you know, working in there. And, but uh, and, and a lot of things could burn up in there because, you know, they didn't have a fire department. Yeah. But I think at least, well, there were, I think, three fires over the centuries and of course that was a I think an intentional intentional attack on on knowledge so that we wouldn't know things and there was uh, there's always people covering things up you know wherever there's sin there's cover up you know yeah. try, trying to change things and blame someone else you know <laughs> the conquerors are usually uh, the evil people you know yeah mm. It's a uh, it's a shame they just had to tread on your head to try and get all these other publications out, isn't it? It's a shame we can't work together. Oh, I know. Yes, we should be working together. Uh, mm. You know, helping out. Yeah, I know what you're referring to. The uh, the other things. Yeah, I mean, we I should all. A, yeah, I had a, a brother, a brother Harry in L.A. His mate. He uh, he was saying last week or the week before. Uh, because we must have been talking about the ISR scriptures, and he said, oh, I want to go and get some, and then he he just heard all this stuff come at him, how evil and wicked it is because they're selling the word and all this stuff that we've heard it all before. And so normally I don't even go into much discussion on YouTube or anything, but I thought, no, I think I should tell him um, why it's that way. Um, a lot of other places are taking massive donations, and... You know, I said, look, if I decided, I put all my music online, but if I decide to start pressing CDs, I'd have to charge some money to do it because I don't have any money. So it's uh, just, yeah. just common and uh, yeah, just common sense. And so he understood that. So, oh, great, I understand now. Wonderful, I'll buy one. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really weird the way that's going around, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Getting the world. Well, it the ISR nice if, does it for free anyway. The ISR puts it online for free. Yeah, it is free. Yeah. Online online is where most everything's going. You can get the download. In fact, I've got a copy of the scriptures right here in front of me on the screen uh, that I downloaded free, you know. Yeah. So uh, the words are free. It's the, it's the books and the printing and the labor of the printing house. They don't do that stuff free. And the people that bring the big semi trucks, these huge loads of books, these fellows that are unloading these books, they're not working for free. They had to pay, pay for the gasoline. They had to buy the truck. They have to feed their families. And that's just for the delivery guys. The people that print the things that work in the office and, you know, the people that work, run the presses and the people that cut the trees down. <laughs> sorry about that. Carbon dioxide. Yeah. That's what it's made out of, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do ship a lot of carbon dioxide all over the planet, you know. Yeah. Hey, Phyllis wants to say hello. Get out. This Phyllis, how you going? Hello. No, I don't want to sit down. Yeah. It's always a pleasure yeah. to see you, Mark. Yeah, you I too. I just enjoy, you know, and, and that little presentation that you did yesterday uh, over what Lou was revealed to Lou in the middle of the night. That was just really special. I just want to thank you. Yeah, mm. pleasure. It's wonderful. <laughs> Working okay. as a team, mate. What? Working what was as that? a team. Working as a team. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. She does everything. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm sitting here doing 
research or studying and she's handling the business you know we both have business degrees from you know, the University of Louisville but you know she's the one that's re using her degree you know <laughs> yeah but she serves you who with it you know yeah. yeah she's running that computer she's got so much information and uh, you know that she has to manipulate just to keep this thing going it's it's a constant effort to just keep the financial things balanced you know yeah. And uh, day by day, it's it's just a struggle, you know, for her. And I keep praying to you who should relieve some of her stress, you know. But uh, you're absolutely right. If you were to start pressing CDs, and I would encourage doing a little bit of both because that's what we have to do. We press CDs or, you know, print them. We have to buy the CDs, the labels, the ink, and you know how much ink is. Oh, my. It's like gold. Anyway. <laughs> liquid gold and it uh, comes in four colors anyway uh, we uh, we put all this stuff together guided by Yahusha's spirit enabling us and giving us the equipment to do it uh, I bought that copying that DVD copying machine a few years ago and that wasn't free you know that didn't they, they didn't just say oh well you want a, a, a DVD copier not a problem here it is Oh, another cup. Yes, wait just a moment. Phyllis is trying to keep me awake. <laughs> uh, we do have a couple or three cups of coffee a day. I've been I've been trying to say to Amy, why don't you get on the line and we'll do a uh, a girls' version of Torah Talk every so often? That'd be fun. We'll that would be. They're a lot smarter than we are. Yeah. I mean, really. yeah. I'll be awake. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, I was just saying, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I'll be in the store, you know, that store, oh, and disgusting. they would, uh, we, we talk about uh, Torah in there a lot, you know, it doesn't seem like uh, that would be possible. But Is that while you're, while you're bowing down to the idols? <laughs> anyway, hmm. right. Well, no, uh, the customers will come in and some of them will be like picking up more of the recent DVDs, you know. And there's many people that come in and they just they pick up like oh look there's two or three I haven't got and then I'll pick up some of the DVDs and uh, you know uh, if they're willing to give me a couple or so bucks for each one that's great that covers the costs yeah. you know and and then it keeps the lights on in the store you know they don't, you know but the power company doesn't just give it to us for free you know and the uh, you know and the books and quite often though I will just be talking with, chatting with someone up front, and they'll bring up a subject, and I'll go, you know, that subject is dealt with on a on a, a seminar that we had, and I'll go back and just give it to them quite often, and and almost, uh, uh, you know, uh, several times a week, somebody will come in, and I'll hand them because they're I can see that they're they're hungry and they're thirsty, so I'll just give them a copy of like Fossilized Customs, you know, and uh, you know they'll, they're they're you know, they can't believe it. They're going, oh, this is a book? And they're looking at the density of the information, and they're just being given this book. A lot of people do that. They'll order books from us by the case, and then they'll just be carrying many copies of them. Like um, a couple of beloved brothers, a, a brother and sister, that, uh, I think they're on a cruise right now, uh, Tom and Doris. They're uh, always, thank you, thank you. They're going on... Uh, Cruises, and they uh, they're retired, and they have uh, been buying cases of fossilized customs for years. And they go on these cruises, and they give away a copy of fossilized customs to certain people that they're guided to give the information to. You know, so that's really great. But I wanted to tell you something else has really been a blessing. This past week, uh, a brother that lives in our brother and sister. That live in Australia uh, enabled Phyllis to get a, a new vehicle. Uh, her car was leaking oil. Her windows didn't roll down. Uh, many things were rusting. Uh, it was it was really getting hard to take care of. And um, anyway, she's got a new car after 15 years, and we want to really praise you for that. You know, we're so thankful for that. And it's Thanksgiving Day. Oh. And we're thrilled. 
We are absolutely beside ourselves. We cannot, we've never experienced an outpouring of help like that. And it's so vital that she has that vehicle because she does everything. With, between her computer and her vehicle, she's running and scurrying around for Yahushua. That's what she does. She has to go to the other facility, the, the main facility, practically every day, except for Sabbath, and picking up things, taking them to the post office, shipping them out into the world. And without a car, uh, she wouldn't be able to do that, you know. Oh, that's wonderful. You can't call a, a oh, bus goodness. to just take you around or, you know, they, they would, uh, or, or a taxi cab, they don't do that stuff for free, <laughs> you know. Well, um, what else is going on? <laughs> what else has been going on? Uh, what else? Oh, yes, I did have a question. The other night at our meeting, we were talking about uh, violating the Sabbath or violating the commandments, and the Sabbath came up. And uh, we've got some people at the meeting who have a farm, uh, crops and... Uh, plantations and sort of things like that and uh, we were talking about the sabbath and they had questions like um well the main thing that came up was about this whole fire thing i want it for those of us who aren't einsteins what exactly in our day-to-day -day life involves fire brother what's fire that's a great that's a great question and you know when phyllis and i learned that uh, many many years ago uh, I interpreted it a certain way. Now, Phyllis, even today, disagrees with me, but she goes along with it because I'm not one of these, you know, beating her over the head uh, type, hey, you've got to do it my way. You're a sinner. Well, we're all sinners. But here's the thing. We do disagree. Phyllis doesn't think that starting a fire is uh, the same thing that I think starting a fire is. But my interpretation is we, we have a fireplace in our home, and uh, that's, that's a wonderful thing. We don't use it that much, but when we do on a cold day, we, all we have to do is push a button, and the gas turns on, and a, an ignition source starts up a fire. And to me, that would be starting a fire, because even though it's a remote switch, it's like one of those uh, games where something moves along, uh, like a ball rolls down a ramp, and then it hits a lever, and then the lever causes something else to move, and then something wiggles down a pole. Well, that's, who started that? Well, the cause, was, there's a cause and there's an effect. Well, if, if you just disconnect yourself from the direct cause, uh, the direct effect, that doesn't mean you didn't cause it, you know. So, yeah. when the little yeah basket finally falls down and covers up the little toy, whatever it is, and traps the little plastic critter, uh, who caused that? Well, it would be the uh, person that, that did the first act. So I, I tell Phyllis not to push the button. And then she says, well, what if the cat pushed it? You know, instead of me. Well, you know, your animals can't do any work either. So you, your animals can't start fires either. But anyway, an internal combustion engine, for example, uh, is a car or a truck or whatever using fuel. And, it, and if you turn the ignition switch and the engine turns over and then fuel starts getting pumped in and sparks start flying, then you are starting a fire. But if you keep your car running all night long, then you didn't start the fire on the Sabbath. It's been sustained. Great. Like, for example, a candle, if you light the candle or the lamp before sunset, and then you extend the fire, like, you know, the fire started already, but if you just take a candle and light another candle, and light another candle, and light another candle, well, eventually that would turn into work. But <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying that you could light up uh, your surroundings. Yeah. Of course, you have to be careful with fire. You know, but yeah. don't leave it unattended. If you go out of a room, you need to blow the candle out. But uh, so a gas stove, a gas stove would be out because that'd be similar to the fire you just talked about in your fireplace. What about an electric stove? That's a good question. Now, if you're just warming food and you're not cooking it, I've always understood that if you're just warming it up, 
uh, then it's okay. Cooking and a microwave well. isn't really a fire. So you cooking know? is so to, to cook it from scratch, you can, it's work. Right, right. Okay. Well, you know, uh, technically, scientifically, uh, work is defined as heat. But oh. that's a scientific okay. type approach. Mm. So, uh, you, uh, you know, you it's measured in thermal quantities. Mm. Those British thermal units. Uh, British thermal units. How'd they get to be British? I've, I've never heard any of them speak with an accent, but... You know, the British thermal units, uh, you know, that's the way they measure things. BTUs. Do you all use BTUs down there? Yeah, that, you're right over my head now. Maybe it's getting too oh. late. <laughs> all right. What does that yeah. stand for? British thermal units. Okay. Yeah. 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 Never heard of it. Uh, we're a colony, you know, we pick up on those things. So, uh, so light bulbs? Light bulbs, yes. Light bulbs are not burning fire, you know. They don't even reach a temperature probably, it's just, to, most of them. Some of them can cause fires, some of these newer ones, but they're not actually fires in themselves. But now the Orthodox Yahudim have deemed that light bulbs are fires, you know. Yeah. Mm. So they don't turn on lights, the Orthodox, they wouldn't do that. Um, they have hired people to come into their homes and turn lights on, which is really strange because that's a, that uh, is a, a breaking of the commandment too. Because if you have if you have a hireling that is coming in a, a goyim, a, what they call a gentile, comes into your house and turns on things for you or whatever, then then you're also violating the commandment too because none of your servants are allowed to work either. Hmm. You know. So your cat can't turn on the fireplace, um, and you're, I mean, why? Why would why fight it? You know, just say, well, we're not like that. You know, yeah. You know, because there's uh, a, there you go. emergencies. Of course, there's emergencies. You have to discount the emergencies. The emergencies are not like a pattern of living. You know, if if for example, on the Sabbath, if I got a phone call uh, from my parents and they said. Uh, one of them had fallen down, and they needed me to be there to help. Uh, I'm there. I'm starting my car. I'm driving down the road. I'll drive for miles and miles and miles and miles, and I will break Sabbath from the, a distance factor because you're not supposed to go out of your vicinity on the Sabbath. If you read Exodus, I think it's chapter 16. Oh, boy, it's, it's early. Uh, uh, you read that no man is to go out of his place on the Sabbath. You know, there's no need to, you know. Yeah. We're not supposed to. We're supposed to be at home, you know, mm -hmm. in our in all your dwellings, not in all of your assembly halls. You, you observe the Sabbath in all your dwellings. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. say to, to chase down a, a Levitical priest and go, we've got to be with you. Yeah, you know, oh, you know, yeah. you, three times a year we are to assemble. Yeah, three times a year. Mm -hmm. If you're a male over twenty, that doesn't mean that the females can't be there, yeah. but it just requires uh, anybody that's twenty years of age and older, uh, male, you know. Yeah. But yeah. uh, uh oh, somebody woke up. <laughs> They're off the bed. Yeah. Yeah, because we were talking about the uh, the plantation and the things that it takes to run a plantation. And I mentioned um, a few newsletters ago, um, Brother Colin, he was talking to somebody about the, the cows. that they okay to milk the cows because they'll get disease and mastitis and all those sort of things? And obviously, uh, you know, you don't, the animals have got to stay safe. So then uh, our brother up here was saying, well, what if I have to spray the trees if there's locusts? <laughs> I said, well, I'd be more worried if there was a plague of locusts coming through, mate. <laughs> that wouldn't be every week, though. No. Mm. You can handle emergencies, and it's not going to be like an all-day thing. You're not going to go, well, I'm going to go take your lunchbox, head out into the field, you know, like it's a regular day. The regular pattern should be, you know, arrest your body. It, he's looking at what your body's doing. There was a lady uh, 
that was a new believer many years ago who said that she turned her water off on her uh, intake on her house to make sure that there was no water being flowing through her water, her uh, the water meter, because then that would be buying and selling. And I said, not exactly, because it's the day you write the check and you and you send the thing off in the mail that you actually did the transaction. So you're arranging for payment on other days. For example, when you buy a loaf of bread, the bread isn't suddenly defiled because it's in your house and you're using it on the Sabbath. You bought it before the Sabbath and you are paid for it. You might pay for it on a credit card and it's paid for, which I don't encourage, after the Sabbath. But when you make the payment for it is when the transaction occurs. Mm. It's a transaction, you know, mm. the, the moment the money passes for the commodity, that's the transaction. Mm. But when you're using it, you made arrangements to use the water. Then, you know, use the water, you know. You can go over the top, can't you? <laughs> you can go freaky, yeah. You can lose it completely and just start, you know, analyzing things. You know, like if if somebody said, wait a minute, this thing had been associated with that person over there, and therefore this is evil. You know, that's that's crazy, you know. I've heard that too, you know, yeah. I've been accused of that. Uh, anyway, the uh, yeah, the Sabbath is a is a wonderful time. It's yeah. it's yeah. really about love, you know. That's what it all is. It's showing that we are in identification with our creator, Yahuwah, because he rested on the seventh day. Yeah. And if we're resting, then we're in identification with that, and we're remembering creation. That's what we're remembering, that he rested on the seventh day. So when we identify with that, then we're acknowledging, and we're actually complying with the, with the reality that, Yahuwah is the creator. That's why evolution has caught on, in my estimation, because people lost the Sabbath, and therefore they, they went off in these uh, tangents, and they believed that Yahuwah uh, did not create anything, and there is no creator. That We just sort of happened. I was uh, having some fun the other day. I, I put up little things in, in that store where uh, little things that I find in magazines, and I'll make little, and I'll glue things together, and I'll put little word bubbles on it, and this one that I just made the other day, I'll, I'll put it up on some place that's not being very useful, and uh, and I turn it into something useful to teach people uh, the truth, but uh, one of the things that, that I put up recently where a person could walk up and just read it at eye level was uh, involving this... Uh, little happy little uh, fellow with big eyes that I just sort of sketched out and he's uh, he's so obviously some kind of a, a marshmallow or something anyway he's saying I was made by someone I was designed by someone and 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 you're looking at me but the person that designed me doesn't believe that there was a designer for him you know and, and it's kind of crazy, but, you know, when, when you look at an object, like a, a pair of glasses, for example, there's a design to this, you know. There's symmetry, there's design, there's a purpose, and a function, and so forth. Well, to think that no one designed this, but the universe just, this thing just happened, is just crazy. And you see, all this comes from, that kind of thinking comes from, uh, how about the person that, that is sitting here holding the glasses? Do you think there was a designer for that person? Absolutely. You see, and when we lose track of the Sabbath, then we also lose track of the truth about the fact that Yahuwah is there, you know, and that he rested on the Sabbath day. So that, that we lost that. It, not, not us. We've been restored. There's a restoration going on, and that Sabbath is one of the key things. Because the Nazarim, that's who we are, the Nazarim, uh, the branches, the watchmen, the guardians, we guard his name and we guard his covenant, his Torah. So his word, you, you, what does it say? You, uh, 
have made great your word, which is his, his covenant, and your name above all. Mm-hmm. So we guard mm-hmm. those two things. Some people say that he made his name greater than the word. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you have made great your word, your name, above all. He's saying both. You know, mm. it's wonderful. Wow. What is Psalm 137? Mm. My... Yeah. So uh, how do you like the green room we're sitting in? It's a very stylish green room. It's uh, very, very chic, very modern. Yes, it is. Mm. Well, I'm I'm seeing the green. Mm. <laughs> I'm definitely seeing the green. Uh, what have we got? We've got uh, some funky little tables. Uh, it looks a bit like a waiting room out of a, hmm, I don't know, kind of like out of a, a Men in Black movie, like a, a the waiting room. It's very space age. There's a lot of really? green, a lot of green, a lot of white. Mm. Well, uh, Oh, uh, speaking of that, I don't know why it popped in my head, but I love that little cow that you put in there. That was the cow that looked like it was walking on the water. <laughs> the cow that was between us, that was yeah. great. Well, you said you wanted a cow, so I said looking for a cow. <laughs> I, I, love, I like cows. I don't know why. Yeah. But uh, if you have to milk your cows on the Sabbath, mm. you have to milk your cows, you know. Yeah. But it isn't like it's going to take all day, you know. Yeah. Hopefully. Mm. Yeah, you have to take care of your animals and feed your animals and give them water. Mm. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, what other problems might they have on the farm or the, the ranch? Um, I think the main shock was just that they're in the uh, tourism industry and uh, closing because they've just, they've just come in and they're learning the Torah and uh, just the shock of... Uh, being open seven days, so tourism, restaurants, things like that. Uh, and so we understand because we're hairdressers. We're the, everybody said when we first opened and closed on the Sabbath with this new business, everybody says, oh, that's suicide. You can't not open on the that day. That's your biggest day for hairdressing. It's like, yeah, well, who provides for us? You know, People come in when you're open. So it's been no problem. You just advertise yeah, you- it. Yeah, you can take a day off. I mean, obviously, Constantine, uh, back in the 4th century, when he decreed in the year 321 CE that all the shops and businesses have to be closed on the venerable day of the sun, which was, at the time, he wor- he worshipped A-P-O-L-L-O, which would have been the sun deity. And he struck a bunch of coins with him and the sun deity sort of side by side there. Uh, So, yeah, and and he was the one that actually caused the the shops and the businesses and the merchants to close. And he made an exception for those that were living out uh, in the farms, in the countryside, so that they could do what they needed to do for planting or whatever, preparing the soil. Uh, And they were the only exception. But this uh, decree which was, you know, called the uh, Edict of Constantine. You can look that up on the internet. And he decreed this under penalty of death, Hmm. the day of the sun. And this is why people have embraced Sunday. And, of course, they go to their uh, pillars of, uh, of jealousy, you know, which is the steeples, you know, Ezekiel chapter 8 talks about the pillar of jealousy at the entrance. Remember that? Mm. So they go to their image of the beast, and then they uh, they assemble on Sunday morning, you know. And uh, that's pretty uh, defiling to be watching. For Yahuwah to look down at his children and see that level of deception, you know. Mm. And when I discovered that many years ago, in the encyclopedias. I was reading encyclopedias when I first started. In fact, I even got the word, the, t- the title, Fossilized Customs, straight out of a sentence that was in an old encyclopedia. That's where I actually originally got that. And so, you see, I didn't originate that term. That was something that some old fellow, probably back in the 1800s, had written 
and he said fossilized customs it was just in the sentence and I said well wow that's that's a very important term I, I, I shouldn't let that go so you know and he was just sharing two or three little things and I was discovering this stuff and of course these people in the world now are writing all their books about why what things really are you know so the the crust is being taken away or the veil that's covering the hideousness and uh, the witchcraft you know mm -hmm. that's beneath all the activities that human traditions have generated it's being revealed you know and so uh, that's great yeah yeah little children are going to grow up with the truth and, and and live lives that are pleasing to the creator mm. that's wonderful mm. Mm. well that's wonderful we'll have to hear the constantine monster song now on the radio when we do it yeah tie that into it okay we're on uh i've been i skyped with uh christopher from uh nazarene from sticks and stones Christopher, I Skyped with him this morning where, uh, cause I've been running out of room on Podomatic and, uh, they are wanting, needing more shows. So we're on the, um, we've now got a page. I haven't done anything to it yet, but we've got a, like a web page thing on the Nazarene media site. So we can just upload every single one of our tour talks on there and people can, uh, backdate and, and click on whatever ones they want. And, uh, so it's, it's in the birthing stages. So it's very exciting. So uh, I've been going back to even the first Torah talk, second Torah talk, and uh, now that they're on air a bit more, I'm sort of editing them a bit more tighter and polishing them up a bit more. And uh, it's great to go back and hear the, uh, the old, I say old material, it was only a few months ago. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a lot of hours of talking here. <laughs> oh, I know, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. each one of these seems like it's turning into an hour. I don't know. Oh, we've been going almost an hour now. Yeah, just about an hour. Yeah. Mm. And it's one uh, almost 1 a.m. there in the morning. Yes. Yes. Wow. And it's um, going on uh, 9 a.m. here. For me, uh, it was we started out about 8. Yes. Adam thinks he's doing a great job reading fossilized customs. Oh, and what you've been doing, reading... Uh, the fossilized customs, the uh, the video book, yeah. and my son is just amazed by it. You know, he's just in awe of it, and really? we all are. Everyone's thrilled. Uh, and all the emails that I've been seeing, people talking on Facebook, mm. and they really, really appreciate that. Mm. Uh, what mm. you've been doing, I like his voice. He's got the. I can't even do his voice. It's just it's, it's like a Hollywood movie voice. It's like. Listening to Matt at Yahoo, and it's like, oh, who is this? This is like a, a baritone. I, I, I can't. He really likes Adam's voice, too. Yeah, yeah I'm jealous, mate. <laughs> no. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Come on funny? In. Yeah, come on. Okay. In. Yeah. I hope that this isn't going to be on. We want the girls to have a, a no. tour talk, you know. This, this, no, this isn't going to be, but I had to tell you, I got a phone call the other day from some fella. And he was really enjoying um, something that you were doing. He, I, I never did understand what it was, but he said you were having um, one of your children speaking. And he said he thought you were my son and that was my grandson. He says, how old is your grandson? <laughs> and it, took, it was real hard for me to explain to him. That, that, you know, and he said, well, where are they? I said, they're in Australia. And he's like, what? He was real confused after yeah. that. I thought that was funny. <laughs> well, that might uh, have been that might have been Micah ready, uh, saying the commandments on the bed. Oh, that was so cute. Was that was it that one maybe? I'm I'm not sure. He said something <laughs> about yeah, it might have been the commandments. I don't know. It's something that you put on YouTube, obviously, and yeah. Yeah. and he just thought it was. Um, he just thought it was wonderful. It would make your heart melt if you watch that. It's just great. <laughs> I can't get enough of it. Oh, anyway. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the water goes down the drain and in the opposite direction down there, doesn't it? Uh, is that a joke or are you serious? I'm serious. Uh, it's called the Coriolis effect or something like that. That's a scientific term. You have to look that up. Anyway, if you uh, let the water go out of a, a basin or a tub, 
and you watch until the very end, there's a little tornado of water, a little spinning column. And uh, down below the equator, it, it's doing something in the opposite direction than it does up here. Oh. Yeah. Well, I think I'd heard that before, but I wasn't sure if it uh, was a joke or not. <laughs> no, no, it's real. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I was just talking to a, a, an associate uh, businessman that does a lot of traveling, and he's going down to Rio de Janeiro. No, I shouldn't say that. That's a pagan term. I retract that term. Uh, there's a pagan word in there. I'm sorry. Anyway, Rio. Let's just call it Rio. And he said that when he goes down there, the first thing he notices is the water's going down the drain in the opposite direction. And I didn't say it to him, but I thought, who would notice a thing like that? You know? <laughs> what? That's <laughs> so strange. Yeah. But uh, apparently it is unsettling because, but I don't really mind which way it goes as long as it goes. Oh, that, that, yeah. I'm not coming up there then. Can't handle that. Nope. <laughs> oh, it'd be confusing. We like our yeah. water to stay the same direction. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, the the Earth is turning at a constant rate, and there's a uh, there's actually a centrifugal force that's created, and it causes things that are in, you know liquids, especially, to want to move in a certain direction because it's the Earth is turning away from it, and it causes it to turn a certain way, you know. It's kind of confusing to try to analyze it mentally, but mm. on the top and the bottom of the turning sphere, the uh, effects are different. Yeah. Well, that uh, that uh, reminds me, I don't know if, I know we've vetoed uh, the moon, but uh, is uh, anything going on with the moon lately, or <laughs> any, oh, new, I, any new inventions of doctrines you've heard of lately? I haven't. I think they've pretty much. I, I really noticed a deathly silence about all that. There was a, there was just a ton of Facebook activity, people emailing me, telling me about uh, how wrong I was about the moon and uh, that the moon sets the Sabbaths of the week, and uh, they can't I, they can't come up with a simple verse that says that you know, and I haven't heard anything out of them since. Apparently, that moon phases video was yeah, enough to that would cause some trouble. You know, yeah. Oh yeah, the, the, I, the, the, I hope that some of them were probably offended by that. But uh, you remember that the the, the wolf man that we have in that video is a is a metaphor or an allegory, and that it's a you know it, it isn't talking about the people themselves. It's talking about the doctrine. My favorite bit was when the two uh, wolf men are screaming at each other, and I put under it. This is what happens if you ask for scriptural proof. <laughs> yeah. They start yeah. growling. Awesome. Yeah. That was funny. Well, you gave that to you. You got to have a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Really. And so there's silence on the moon front. Ooh. Oh, there is. Yeah. There's. Uh, it seems like uh, a lot of people were just falling up for that, and we we needed to come to address that because these new winds of doctrine are going to be blowing around and we don't know what the next one's going to be you know it's just mm. here it comes and if we don't have a solid foundation then you know we will get carried away you know mm. so that's what we have to study torah for you know things that are that are uh, considered wrong now as far as people that whose heart doesn't condemn them for what they're doing on a particular sabbath uh, as they're growing we don't want to be uh, lecturing them and condemning them. We want to just slowly guide them towards, you know, a, a better understanding. And remember that it's not about knowledge, but it's about love. And that we don't want to discount the knowledge either, you know, and say, well, those laws don't apply to us. Well, that's the dragon's teachings, that they don't apply to us. Because if they don't apply to us, who do they apply to? And why would there be two laws? One that per pertains to you and one that does not but rather that that would pertain to someone else or another group. You know, that's divided minds. You can't have that. You know, we're all his children, you know, and uh, there's only one body. There's not two bodies. You know, like when I was in my uh, Christian days, when I was first learning Christianity, I, I of course, first learned idolatry you know, through Catholicism, but the uh, Christian uh, teachings 
they had a mindset that there was Christians and there were Jews, and that's all that really mattered. That it really mattered in the in the faith. You know, it was a Judeo Christianity. That's a another. I, I guess we would call that a maxim. You know, mm. a one word maxim, Judeo Christianity, a compound maxim, compound word maxim. But uh, the idea of Judeo Christianity is is a way of programming people to think, well, there's Jews and there's Christians. What else is it? But, well, there's uh, the lost Israelites, you know, that are being restored to the covenant, you know. And that's missing in both of them, you know. It would just be that yeah. they're uh, upset. They're a subset of apostasy. They have, an apo they, have, they have the Torah, but they're the older brother. And mm -hmm. now we're not talking about the government, the state of Israel. We're talking about Israelites, wherever they may be. You know, they, they're all over the world, you know. But the tribe of Yehuda, or Yehuda is uh, what they call the Jews, is uh, one tribe. It's the royal tribe from which all the kings would come and are and have come. And our Messiah comes from that tribe, you know. What was it? Caleb came from that tribe. And, and Yehusha, his friend, that they call Joshua, was from the tribe of Ephraim. Mm. So, yeah, that's interesting, too, because... The tribe of Ephraim, which was the lead tribe, right, just above uh, Yehuda in the in the land when the divided kingdom occurred, and uh, Ephraim was the large space of land, and the tribe of Ephraim dwelled there, and then the tribe of Yehuda. So those that that's what they're uh, they're called, Ephraim and Yehuda. So the ten tribes kind of are referred to in general by the term Ephraim. Mm. Even though Dan and Zebulon and Naphtali and, and Reuben and all those tribes are, are, are included, the, the term Ephraim will include all the tribes of, of the ten northern tribes. Uh, not always, but in some cases, you know. Or the house of Israel, that's another term for the ten tribes. Anyway, they're dispersed into the nations. They went by land and sea as the Assyrians were pounding them for decades, and then after a while, they, uh, they, they they went into the colonies is where most of them went mm. because it was a sea empire. And um, I, was, I thought it was interesting that the term Phoenicia, which was coined by the Greek Herodotus, and subsequently the Greeks called them Phoenicians, the sea peoples, they're the Israelites. And, uh, of course, many of them were Vikings. <laughs> Another term for the same people. And anyway, the uh, the coins from the land of Israel had a little date palm on them. There was a date palm image on the coin. And so that's what the word Phoenicia means. Phoenici means date palm. I thought that was interesting. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so naturally, uh, Herodotus would see this Phoenician uh, money and go, Hmm, yeah, that's a date palm. Well, we'll call these people the Phoenicians. The Phoenic and then now modern historians are going, well, what, what other nations in the past had date palms on their money? <laughs> well, and they don't even know who these mysterious people are, mm. the historians today. Yeah. They're going, we don't know who they are or where they came from, but they seem to be all over the place. Yeah, well, that's because they were a sea empire. They had mm. colonies all over the Mediterranean, uh, you know, England, Scotland, Ireland, you know. Of course, they didn't go by those names back then. That was called Hibernia, you know, mm. and Norway, all those Viking people, you know. Why did, um, I was just thinking when you, a couple of minutes ago, you were talking about the lost tribes. Why did Yahuwah... Uh, Call, why do we call the, the lost tribes Ephraim? I know that was Joseph, uh, Joseph's youngest son who was given the birthright when the hands were switched. But uh, why weren't they called Joseph? Because that's Israel's son. That's, that's correct. That is the tribe of Joseph, as well as, well, Ephraim and Manasseh were, were the tribe, the two tribes, the children of Joseph. Uh, 
So he, he married a, an Egyptian. I think she was the daughter of uh, their pagan high priest there, you know. Uh, they had a, you know, a relationship with uh, each other. And he, w he was given this woman to be his, his wife. And the two children, Ephraim and Manasseh, Manasseh was the older son and Ephraim the younger son. So when Yaakov or Yisrael crossed his arms and put the blessing of the right hand upon the head of Ephraim, Yosef was freaking out and said, oh, no, father, uh, he's the older one. I, and that's why I put him on your right, you know. And then he puts it, you know, his hands are crossed over. And he says, I know, son, I know. But this one is the one that's going to receive the first, you know, the double portion blessing. So that blessing that was placed upon Ephraim applied to uh, that one little boy has gone off into the world. And that blessing is upon all of us that were the lost tribes. That blessing remains. Wow. And uh, that's so awesome to think that Yahuwah has blessed a people who are not a people at the time when they discovered it. But he said that, you know, I forget the text, but I was just reading it yesterday, that uh, I'm, I'm going to call a people, my people, who were not a people, you know. And it, it has to be talking about the lost or the scattered tribes of Israel, you know. Israel being the person that was conveying the, uh, the blessing upon the sons. But Yosef is not usually listed as one of the tribes. Mm. But rather, he's got two tribes now, but the name Yosef is, uh, is just not there. And we have the, the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh. Mm. And I seem to recall that Manasseh had two, well, it, it, it was, it's, it's really uh, not so much about the land and the positioning of the tribes in the land, because they were all basically the plan of Yahuwah was to scatter them into the nations so that they would become the nations, you know. So, and that's what we're awakened yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. I think I saw a mass or something. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Scary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any uh, any other topics that we could cover, or are uh, we almost? I don't know. I don't know. I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> well, anyway, the, the next seminar, I'm I'm starting to get digging into the into the research, yeah. and it's more in heaven. And I yeah. noticed that uh, it's causing a big stir in the spiritual world. There's a lot of uh, strange things going on, and uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of friends and uh, family, they're, they're being attacked. My son's water heater blew up. Of course, I, yeah. you know, maybe that wasn't spiritual, but uh, mm. it just seems like uh, there's more things going on. So we need to pray for protection. Yeah, yeah. But the, the war in heaven is, un, a lot of people think that, well, they don't think about it too much. It's like something that they've read about in the scriptures, and they go, well, uh, that was a long time ago, you know. But the rebellion of the, of the adversary, when he actually became prideful in his heart, he wanted to be like Yahuwah, and we read about it in Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 14, uh, and how his end is going to be there uh, ahead. And the first, uh, you know, uh, thoughts about the war in heaven are that it's pretty much dismissed, it's over. But it's really waging, it's getting more and more and more intense all the time. But the battlefield is not the thing that's understood. And I, and I just learned that myself mm. in this research. The battlefield is not outer space or even the earth. The battlefield is in the mind, the mind of man. So Yahuwah searches hearts and minds which is the same thing. Wow. And, you know, that's what the seminar on the lamp was about, teaching people what the heart is. It's the lamp of the body. And uh, that's where the battlefield is. And I was so uh, amazed by it. That's what, the battle, that's what the war in heaven is. The adversary wants to capture 
the hearts and minds. And that's what we're seeing is wrong with the world. And the world, he uses three things. I think it's uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. 1 John, or 1 yeah, can it? And he's, he, he's uh, whatever we've set our hearts on, that's where we get the word lust. Epithuma or something like that. Epithemia. I think that's the Greek word, but uh, if we set our hearts on something, then we're lusting for that. That's what the word lust comes from. Mm. It's set our hearts on, you know. And the first item that we, he wants us to set our hearts on is the lust of the flesh, which is pleasure, and the lust of the eyes, which is possessions. And then we have the pride of life, which is position. Mm. So we've got those three things to fight all the time, you know. And those are the first, those are the three things that when we're in our flesh, you know, we, we have pleasure, possessions, and position. And that's what all the commercials that we see on television and all the radio commercials, they're all ge geared at those three things. You're not who you need to be, or you don't have what you need to have, or you need to pamper your flesh and seek pleasure. You know, those are the three areas Yahushua was tempted in. And those are the same things that we have to fight. And that's the battlefield. It's in our hearts. It's what we set our hearts on. And if we set our hearts, according to First Yahukana chapter 216, if we set our hearts on pleasure and possessions and position, then we're we're sowing to our flesh, you know, and we're gonna reap death. Wow. So that war is just you know, it's going on all the time, and it's uh, amazing. And this is the early stages of the study. Wow. Can't wait it's for this one. Start. Yeah, you have to find out what, what this war is and where mm. it's being fought wow. and what are the weapons being used against us mm. and then what our weapons are. We have something called the armor of light. Wow. And you know what that is. That's the indwelling of Yahushua. You know, that's where, you know, we, he is in us. And the, and the enemy flees when we resist him. And we, you know, we have the sword, the, the Torah talks. You know, we're talking about what, what we're supposed to do. And uh, that's what Yahushua used. He always used the sword when he was fighting the battle with the demon. And that, that makes the demon flee. He goes, whoops, I've sown your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. But here's the thing. The war in heaven, it actually focuses on, like a laser beam on one thing, and that is the identity of the one that we serve. And, and, the, and that's the thing. He wants to pretty much keep everything that Yahuwah has created, and every, even his commandments, with some exceptions, to make people believe they're, they're worshiping Yahuwah, the cr true creator, but they're not using the name. So the name is removed, so his identity is not known. And so therefore, it's like an identity thief. And so it's really a war about identity in the hearts. So people say, he doesn't care if I use the word L-O-R-D. He knows my heart. Well, that's because your heart is the ground that the enemy has is holding. Mm. He's got you in that in that trap. It's a mental fortress. Yeah. So it's amazing. This war in heaven study is just amazing. It brings to bear all sorts of different disciplines of scripture. Yeah, and here's that verse I just saw it here. Revelation twenty two seventeen. And uh, it says, and the spirit and the bride say come and let him that hears say, come, and let him that is athirst come. Who, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The water of life is, of course, from the fountain, and the fountain is Yahushua. But, uh, oh, that's a strange, oh, that's the, I was using the uh, King James Version there. That's going to offend people. <laughs> yeah. Now, look at this. Yeah. Anyway, the bride and the spirit say, come, 
Now I'm, I'm back on the scriptures, 1998. He who thirsts, come, and he who desires it, take the water of life freely without paying. For I, witness, for I witness to everyone hearing the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, Elohim shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. So that's important too. Yeah. Mm. Yes, it is. Beautiful. Well, you have a lovely yep. day, guys. Okay. Well, you're going to get some sleep now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll see you next week at the same time. Yep. It's great. Okay. Wonderful. Well, we love you. Yeah, love you too, mate. Talk to you later. Have a good week. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Talk. Talk. I said little.